On that note, I am honored to introduce our keynote speaker this morning, a distinguished economist who is currently the Secretary of Finance. Prior to his appointment as Finance Secretary, he served as Governor of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas from 2019 to 2022. Under his leadership, the Philippine Central Bank was among the first to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic and deploy decisive measures to cushion its adverse impact and pave the road to an early recovery. Dr. Jokno served as Budget Secretary under three presidents, where he pursued an expansionary fiscal policy to finance investments in human capital development and public infrastructure. He served as an advisor and consultant to various multilateral agencies like the World Bank, Asian Development Bank, European Commission, the U.S. Agency for International Development, for work in the Philippines, China, and in transitioning economies like Vietnam, Cambodia, and Mongolia. As Finance Secretary, Dr. Jokno seeks to rally the economic team to achieve three broad development goals by 2028. Reduce the deficit to GDP ratio to pre-pandemic rates, bring down poverty incidence to single digits, and achieve upper middle income economy status by the end of the Marcos Jr. administration. Dr. Jokno seeks to go beyond the headline economic expansion and achieve a brand of inclusive and sustainable growth with equity. Ladies and gentlemen, the Philippine Secretary of Finance, the Honorable Dr. Benjamin Jokno. Thank you very much, Ambassador Austria, for that very long introduction. Alain Hoclier of UBS Securities Canada, Isvan List of Export Development Canada, Gaurav Marwaha of City Canada, our private sector reactors from Manulife Philippines, Canada ASEAN Business Council, and Sunlight Philippines. Members of the economic team, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. The Philippine economic team is thrilled to be here in Toronto for our very first Philippine economic briefing in Canada. Canada and the Philippines share deep people-to-people -people ties, and I believe that this serves as a solid foundation and launch pod for an even more vibrant economic partnership in the years ahead. With nearly a million Filipinos living and working in Canada, overseas Filipinos remain a strong force in, our, in both our economies. In 2022, gas remittances from overseas Filipinos in Canada reached 1.2 billion US dollars. And for the first four months of this year, gas remittances already grew by 3.3% year on year. We have uncharted waters to explore in terms of trade and investments in mutual areas of interest, including electronics, manufacturing, machineries, and electricity, mining, and agriculture. In 2022, Canada emerged as the country's 20th largest trading partner, with total trade reaching 1.5 billion US dollars. The economic team is glad to be here, not only because it is our first economic briefing in Canada, this event also marks our last investor roadshow before President Ferdinand Marcos Jr.'s second State of the Nation address. This is happening in less than two weeks where he will be unveiling the work that we've done in his first year of office and what a remarkable year it was for the Philippines. Amid an uncertain global environment, year one of the Marcos administration demonstrated the Philippine economy's remarkable ability to rise above the tide and grow beyond expectations. Following a 46 year high growth performance of 7.6% in 2022, we are seeing continued rapid growth amid a slowing global economy. In the first quarter of 2022, the Philippine economy grew by a robust 6.4%, exceeding all expectations. 
This growth was broad-based, led by our vibrant services sector, then followed by industry and agriculture. Strong, robust demand underpins the Philippines' robust growth. Household consumption has continued to lift demand, expanding by 6.3%, while investments grew by 12.2%. This is despite rising commodity prices due to global supply chain disruptions. As a result, the Philippines' growth outpaced major emerging economies in Asia in the first quarter of 2023. We grew faster than India, Malaysia, Indonesia, China, Vietnam, and Thailand. Our sustained growth momentum gives us confidence that we'll reach our target growth of 6 to 7% this year and a faster growth rate of 6.5 to 8% in 2024 to 2028. International financial institutions share our optimism. The World Bank and the International Monetary Fund both upgraded their growth outlook on the Philippines just recently to 6% for 2023 against the backdrop of slower growth in developed markets globally. The Philippines also maintains investor-grade credit ratings. Just recently, Fitch Ratings revised its outlook on the Philippines' triple B rating from negative to stable, citing the country's growth outlook and sound macroeconomic policy framework. Our jobs market continues to be a bright spot. In May 2023, the unemployment rate dropped to 4.3%, the lowest since April 2005. Our consistently low level of unemployment is a source of optimism, especially as the labor force participation rate continues to rise. The labor force participation rate went up to 65.3% in May, higher than 64% in the same month last year. The quality of jobs also continues to improve, with the underemployment rate dipping to 11.7%. This is the second lowest underemployment rate since April 2005. Our gross international reserves remain ample. As of end June 2023, it stood at 99.8 billion US dollars, equivalent to 7.4 months worth of import cover. And this is above the IMF's ideal threshold of three months worth of imports. Inflation remains to be a top-of-mind concern. It is encouraging that Philippine inflation eased for the fifth consecutive month in June 2023 to 5.4%, the lowest in 13 months, and this is down from 6.1% in May. The sustained slowdown in inflation suggests that the government's inflation mitigating measures are gaining ground. We're confident that we can bring inflation back to the target range of 2 to 4 percent by the fourth quarter of this year and below the lower limit of the target by the first quarter of 2024. In terms of policy, the Philippine government is continuously harmonizing efforts to ensure a timely analysis of the demand and supply of key commodities through the Interagency Committee on Inflation and Market Outlook. The committee, chaired by myself and Secretary Balisakan, puts science in demand and supply analysis and ensures that our approach to tackling food and non-food inflation is highly attuned to realities on the ground. The Philippine economy draws strength from its sound fiscal policy framework. Now we are gathering momentum from the structural reforms we have enacted over the years. We are committed to a sound fiscal management through the medium-term fiscal framework. This framework guides our efforts to reduce the fiscal deficit, promote fiscal sustainability, and enable robust economic growth. Our targets are to reduce the debt 
to GDP ratio to less than 60% by 2025, cut the deficit to GDP ratio to 3% by 2028, and maintain high public infrastructure spending of 5 to 6% of GDP annually. Sound fiscal management gives us solid financial footing to invest, in, to invest more in high growth sectors that will be of benefit to more Filipinos. To complement this, we are pursuing structural reforms to, to accelerate investment in trade in the Philippines. We have opened up our economy to greater foreign participation through the amendments to the Retail Trade Liberalization Act, Foreign Investment Act, and Public Services Act. The amendments to the Retail Trade Liberalization Act simplified the qualification requirements and reduced the minimum paid up capital requirement for foreign retailers from $2.5 million to half a million dollars. Meanwhile, the amended Foreign Investment Act narrows the scope of investment subject to review provides flexibility, transparency in the adjustment of the foreign investment negative list, and liberalizes the practice of profession. Lastly, the Public Service Act, which is in close to a century old law, was amended to allow full foreign ownership of public services, such as telecommunications, toll roads, expressways, shipping, and airports. We have restructured our corporate tax regime to make it more competitive with our ASEAN peers and conducive to strategic investments in priority sectors. The CREATE law was enacted to reduce corporate income taxes, previously the highest in the ASEAN region, to 20% for domestic, small, and medium enterprises, and 25% for other corporations. To attract strategically important investments, the CREATE law provides for a flexible and generous incentives system that is performance-based, targeted, time-bound, and transparent. Now, since the enactment of that new law up to May and May 2023, the Fiscal Incentives Review Board approved the grant of incentives to 39 projects representing 694 billion pesos, or approximately 12.4 billion US dollars in investment capital. These projects are expected to create more than 28,000 jobs. Canada, a global leader in clean energy, may benefit from the recent liberalization of the Philippines' renewable energy sector. Foreign enterprises may now participate in the country's renewable energy sector, particularly solar, wind, hydro, and tidal energy, 100%. Now we are driving momentum towards a sustainable, inclusive, and resilient economic future. And to achieve that, we are building better and building more. And this can only be made possible by higher public investments supported by expanded private sector participation. Decades prior, the Philippines was severely underinvesting in infrastructure, foregoing its high multiplier effects on the economy. In fact, from, 20, uh, from 2001 to 2014, infrastructure spending was only at around 2% of GDP on average. We picked this up to reach about 5% of GDP when the previous administration came in with its ambitious build build, build infrastructure program. And now we are continuing that program with a twist, and that is we are encouraging more public-private partnerships. Earlier this year, the National Economic and Development Authority approved 194 high-impact infrastructure flagship projects, or IFPs, with an indicative total cost of 8.3 trillion pesos, or around 152 billion US dollars. Let me repeat that. We have now available some 100 ready to implement projects, 194 ready to implement projects with a total cost of about 100, 
52 billion US dollars. Through strategic co-investments with the private sector, we are upgrading infrastructure across critical sectors, including water, digital connectivity, health, power, and agriculture. We are creating a policy environment conducive to effective, strategic, and growth-enhancing public-private partnerships. And this is central to the Marcus Administration's economic transformation agenda. Within the first 100 days of the new administration, we enhanced the implementing rules and regulations of the Build, Operate, Transfer Law to reflect best investment policies and practices to uphold the viability and bankability of PPP projects. We also revised the Investment Coordination Committee guidelines on PPP approvals to ensure faster processing and approval of PPP projects. Furthermore, we revised the Joint Venture Guidelines to simplify processes, maximize competition, and strengthen safeguards that ensure technical and financial viability of governments. This year, the President and both Houses of Congress are prioritizing the legislative approval of the proposed Public-Private Partnership Act before the end of the year. This measure provides a unified legal framework for all types of PPPs at the national and local levels and will make the policy environment for PPPs clearer, more predictable, and more competitive. One year on, we have laid the groundwork for growth and established a clear vision for the Philippines' dynamic economic future. This is the right time to build better more, and we look forward to do, to do this together with the Canadian business and financial community. Thank you very much.